But Rob, you joined the club back in 1958. How did, how did that come about? <laughs> well, that's quite a story, actually. Well, that's what we want to hear. Because <laughs> I'd come up to Melbourne uh, after the Olympic Games, which I was involved in 1956 down in Melbourne. Competing to... or...? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no competing. <laughs> Being drunk one day and looking for a job and right. wandered in and, uh, and, and joined the Olympic Games, and it happened that they happened to have a gap in the uh, official film unit that they were making. And the bloke that happened to open the door while I was talking with the... Uh, with a receptionist when I went in looking for a job uh, and it was on the turnstiles or sweeping up or anything to see the, see the games and a little man walked through with a pipe and what have you and uh, the girl said, Mr Caterns, do you need anyone in the film division? And he looked me up and down and said, follow me. And when I went upstairs, the biggest attribute that I had uh, was uh, well, he asked me three things. What are you doing? I said, I've just been discharged from the Army Officers College down in uh, Portsea. Uh, I had six and a half years in the National Bank. Hmm, sport, he said. What sport do you play? I said, I'm a yachty. A yachty, he said. And he stood up, shook his hands up and said, welcome to the film division. And that was That's Basil Couture. Yeah, yeah. We later joined this club and became yeah. my dear friend. Yeah. And Basil, That's his uh, daughter, Angela, on radio at the moment, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. OK, sorry. And it was no. Basil with Tommy Thompson yeah. and I was a member of the first um, committee who began our newspaper, the, the, yeah. the Publications yeah. Committee. Yeah. Right. And it was Basil who picked Offshore. So, you know, if funny things happened. Well, picked the name off. Picked, it was Basil who called it. We, we were sitting right. around okay. sort of saying, what are we going to call this magazine? Right. And um, it was Basil who said, I reckon it should be Offshore. And well, for want of a better name, yeah, that's what we yeah, did, yeah. and it's quite amazing now to see the progression that, yeah. uh, and the uh, the evolution of that magazine. Yeah. But were you you moved to Sydney then? Did you? Yeah. So yeah. after the games, I was a Melbourne bloke, came right. to Sydney, um, got on a boat called Munya, saw an ad in the paper. I saw it was sailing 16, uh, 14 footers out of the St Kilda 14 footer club right. down in Melbourne. Yeah. Came to Sydney, saw the harbour, saw boats like I'd never seen before and conditions like I'd never seen before and said, Christ, this will do me. <laughs> and uh, answered an ad in a paper that someone was looking for crew. And I think the bloke's name was Sid Hall, who just bought, uh, built an Alan Payne boat, a most beautiful thing, called Munya. Oh, right, and she yeah. was the predecessor of, of Solo. Yes. She was steel? No, she was wood. Wood, OK. And in fact, yeah. this, this bloke had wanted to have completely laid decks on this boat and he couldn't get the timber he wanted so he went into the forest and he found a tree and then he hired a, 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 a timber yard to cut it up to him so he could, a fastidious bloke, so fastidious I couldn't stand him. Loved the boat, <laughs> hated sailing. Was the boat still around? I, think. I don't know what's happened to her. It's around the spit, around in um, Middle Harbour, he had a home overlooking the water. And all, all I wanted was out. So I saw another ad in the paper, and it was, uh, you know, Mick York on the good ship Magic. So I went round and um, uh, joined Mick. And that was uh, the start of a, a whole new life <laughs> on, on, on the good ship Magic. And I joined this club after about six months, I think 12 months, with Mick sailing on Magic, doing the odd up and down. She, she was a funny little, like a big dragon, 35 foot dragon. No, no life rails, no anything. Leaked like a sieve. Did you go offshore? Yeah, we yeah. used to go offshore. Yeah. In fact, the biggest, scariest thing I'd ever had was we were going up Lake Macquarie and I thought, Nick, Mick's a great sailor, he's a great navigator, I'm sure. And when he got out his road map as we went out the heads, <laughs> we had him like Macquarie, he began to wonder, oi, you know, is this the most sophisticated charts and does this bloke know where he's going? But what were your, what were your early memories of the club itself? And the well, just, just to finish that story, yeah, if I may, Pete, yeah. was that Mick said, why don't you join the club? And I said, Christ, and I can't remember how much it was, but let's say just uh, it was 10 quid a year. And I said, I haven't got to spare 10 quid, Mick. And Mick said, I'll tell you what it will do. And there were two of us, Dick Ranson and I, who we ended up sharing a flat, who sailed with me. He said, why don't you two join the club? I'll tell you what I'll do. You put a couple of quid down to start. I'll pay you, pay your fee 
and you give me a quid a week. Now, I told Mick that story, reminded him of it the other day, and Mick looked at me and says, Christ, it doesn't sound like me, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he couldn't remember. And I, and, and I said, well, Mick, that's exactly what happened, and that's why I joined the club and how I joined the club. And I look back now when the club's looking for new members and that, and I think, well, the same thing should apply. All these skippers should have, with their regular crews should sort of say, well, hang on. Well, you yeah, hang on. Anyway, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just yeah, a thought, but yeah. oh, Mick couldn't believe it. <laughs> that. But we had some great times, you know, sailing with Mick and... Uh, I suppose, I suppose the club was only a little ship then, was it? Or was it well, as I came in, in, in today, I just reminded myself the Cedric, Cedric Emanuel um, etchings on the wall out there. And that's the club I remember. Yeah. Uh, a flat, couple of slipways, bit of a flat roof over a working area up near the clubhouse, rickety set of steps, and up you went into this with a, with a little bar and, and I, I can't remember, a few chairs and what have you. And uh, after a few, you know, some of the races, you used to congregate back there, and you could feel the club rocking. She actually swayed when it got going on, on its, you know, on, on the, the building wasn't too yeah. secure. Yeah. But um, but those were the days when lots of things happened at the club, and memories come back, you know, that uh, you used to go flat rock barbecues were on. Johnny Farron Price in the later years had his boat aerial queue down here and um, we used to have um, go up to Pitwater quite a lot, up to Coasters Retreat, round the fire, keg of beer and Ariel used to take the beer, the barrels of beer and then we'd have a race, the Poor Oil Memorial Trophy and some of those races up to there, big bonfire, keg of beer tapped uh, hurricane lantern sort of swinging off a tree, uh, singing rugby type songs and yeah. and uh, telling lies and doing what what you do. Yeah. And there was a there was a sort of a feeling about the club. That's what it was. A bunch of guys from all walks of life. You know, from Bill Northern. I remember used to yeah. take Caprice out there, and um, uh, you know, getting used to have a too, everyone had too many drinks yeah. and being crooked the next day and Bill saying, Christ, you Bill's your eyes look crooked. <laughs> I remember him saying, you ought to be inside here looking out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it was just a, a fun time. Yeah, great camaraderie. Uh, and, and it was all about boats and what you did with them. And, and this, this, uh, it was more than a sport, it became a way of life, almost an obsession. Yeah. Uh, and Friday nights down at the club, you know, we're all bachelors, or I was, and most of my mates were at that stage, all bachelors. Friday night you'd get, uh, you know, pickled down here and couldn't remember what you'd done. And the old, then the bar changed, and David Good, uh, who uh, designed the club, and uh, Padge Bailey, and some of the wonderful old characters, and Oh Christ! But then, you know, then the drinking. Not not too much long thereafter that you got involved with the Asta, the famous yacht Asta, the schooner, and you had some wonderful adventures. I would call them the swashbuckling era <laughs> with the characters, and there was more fun ashore. I mean, you sailed hard, yeah. raced hard, but you played hard ashore. So let's talk about the Asta and your adventures with Asta. Well, Mick said to me at one, we still stay at, um, sorry still sailing on um, on magic when he said look a mate of mine at the club Maxie Crawford is putting together a crew for this big 72 foot schooner Asta if you want to go and do something a bit upmarket <laughs> dear old magic uh, that might be the boat for you and it was good of Mick to sort of suggest it and recommend to Maxie. So I arrived down, introduced myself, and the next thing, we were part of the Asta crew, which was, began a whole change, it was a life changer. Not only within the sailing circles, but, you know, first overseas trip was on Asta uh, when we took it to America in 63. But prior to that, you know, here was this magnificent thing out of a, out of a painting almost this beautiful boat uh, 
And, you know, m early memories came before she had life rails and before she was raced. And this is when Peter just bought it. Peter Warner. Peter Warner mm -hmm. bought it. Peter Warner bought the boat. And his dad, Sir Arthur Warner, who had Winston Churchill and the family used to sail that boat, uh, was highly involved because, as he said, he did a deal with Peter. Peter bought the boat, and I think it was 10,000 quid. And AG, old Sir Arthur, sort of said, and I said, you buy the boat and I'll maintain it and fit it out. Well, as he said a couple of times, he got the wrong end of the stick, old Sir Arthur, because <laughs> it was a bit of fitting out. Yeah. But one of the memories was, one of the first times we took it out was a race up to Lion, I think it was a race, or we went up to Lion Island and back in a roaring westerly, which the old girl just, of course, loved, a reaching breeze up. And she had all, no one had really got all the sails out of the locker. And old Maxie's on there, and these were sails, the old cotton sails, with, um, with hanks on them, that hanked onto the forestay. And, of course, reaching up there, Maxie kept saying, well, and a crude old winch down the back and handy billies and all the rest, get them on, get them on, get them on against the breeze, and all of a sudden there'd be a rip, and way it'd go, and he'd say, righto, put another one, and poor old Peter was whinging, and quietly Maxie said, no, no let's get rid of all this old shit. <laughs> so sail after sail was winched on and split down the middle until by the end of that race, uh, you know, a complete new wardrobe was needed urgent, was urgently, but those were, you know, an introduction to the likes of Twitty Thompson, uh, who was a, just a wonderful guy, Maxie Crawford, uh, Dr Bill, Bill Hughes soon, soon joined us, uh, Vasco da Gama, or Brian Warren, who was a oh, crazy old character, <laughs> loved, loved a drink. Uh, Gary, um, Wheatley. Uh, Gary Wheatley, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brucey Moxham, um, Sandy, Sandy Schofield, uh, Dale Munro. Uh, As I appropriately said, swashbuckling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Brucey Rosenberg, <laughs> who had a real affinity through the previous owner that Peter bought it off, the Stewart brothers, uh, Bill Stewart. Uh, he, he owned the boat. and. Uh, at that stage, and Bruce had known him through Prince Alfred days or something, you know, old school tie and all that sort of stuff. And uh, Bruce, he was just a wonderful guy. And but you mentioned America and Astor. Tell us what happened there. You left from Sydney to go to America for the Transpac race. Is that right? For the yeah. Well, the first race we did was 61. Hobart race. Hobart yeah. race, and yeah. got line on, on us, yeah. line on us mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Then 62 was the Ondine year. Yeah. where we'd beaten uh, Ondine round the Tasman Light by about, I think it was four hours ahead. And we were starting to go down and shave and clean up and wacko, the songs were coming, we were almost in Hobart. And t then the wind dropped and we just sat there. And um, Ondine came round the corner and then it was a run up the Derwent and it used to take eight of us to lift the spinnaker pole on uh, on Asta, and it was jive for jive going up to do it. So eight guys said, grab hold of the pole, take it off the mast, walk it backwards, put it in, while I'm being alongside us with, a, with an aluminium spinning <laughs> pole, one bloke's going jive, jive, <laughs> and yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah. So the thing was, Peter had planned this. Um, but, uh, sorry, just on the. I beat your hand by a minute. I by think. a minute. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Beat us by yeah, a minute in yeah, the end. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but what a sale that was. Yeah. Uh, and in '63, Peter said, "Well, we're going." He planned this about 12 months before. Uh, we're going to take the boat to America to do the Transpac race. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. So the saying became amongst the crew, stay free till 63. Don't get married, don't get hitched, because boy, we got a, we got a trip coming up in 63. Yeah, yeah. Well, Daly got Munro didn't make it, he got married in 62 to the local pie maker's daughter and, and wonderful Susie. And you know, they began to drop off the perch and what have you, but on the 9th of March, I think it was, uh, 1963, uh, we slipped the lines off here and set sail for America. 
uh, on Asta for the race. Um, Graham, Peter Warner couldn't come, so his brother Graham uh, was skipper. And uh, there was a Billy Cole from New Zealand. There was the Bird Dog, Brian Lancaster, Sandy Schofield, uh, Gary Wheatley. Uh, there was seven of us, I think. Oh, and, and uh, JB. Um, Oh, JB, uh, the, the, uh, John Burgess, Johnny Burgess, yeah. Johnny Burgess the navigator, mm. as far as New Zealand. So off we went, with a, had a terrific send off here the night before, and then quite a fleet came off to, you know, see us off. And I remember my mother and father, who didn't know boats from a beach from a bull's foot, came up and said, you're not venturing out in that little boat, are you? And that little boat, you know, was the Enormous biggest, there. grandest, yeah. the grandest boat in the yeah. fleet. But yeah. uh, so we headed across. And it was quite strange on that. As we went out the heads, oh, the bird dog began, I think, setting a world record not long after we cleared the heads. He prepared a fishing line with a big lump of bungee cord and a, a, and a, um, a spinner on the other end, uh, which was set within sight of Australia, and I think it was taken out within sight of America, and he hadn't had a touch. <laughs> and I reckon that's the, the world record. <laughs> Done. 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 <laughs> but as we went out, you know, the temptation was we'd been racing for a couple of years, you know, guys. Trim the headsail, uh, trim the sail, until someone said, why? Why? Forget it, boy. What we'll do is we'll just alter the, the course of the boat a point or two, and we'll ease sheets and go where the wind takes us. And that took a, get, a lot of getting used to, actually, from you know sailing a racing boat to sailing a cruising boat. And it was a different. So we got to New Zealand. Oh, they, they'd, they'd put a, um, a refrigerator down below and a diesel engine, little diesel engine on the deck had been built to run the fridge. And there was a little, build, little box built over. Well, we copped a couple of seaways over there. And by the time we got the engine had seized, by the time we got to New Zealand. Uh, the other thing about that is we, amongst the, the uh, provisions we took on board was a hundred dozen cans of, um, Tui's flag ale, because each of the cans had a Sydney Harbour Bridge on it in those days. Hundred dozen. I think we took a hundred dozen on board. Right. Of, of that was given to us. Right. And the belief was, no one can make beer in, the, in, in, in anywhere where we're going, including America, as good as Australian beer. So we'll never run out. And I said to the guys at the time, and I want to put on a dozen bottles of, I think it was Tarek's Lemonade. Lemonade! What do you want lemonade for? You know, we've got all this bloody grog on board. Well, it wasn't too long before the lemonade <laughs> was well and truly with a bit of a sweet taste in the mouth. And everywhere we went, including New Zealand, we fell in love with the local beer. So in, in New Zealand, Johnny Burgess left us and a couple of other guys flew in. Um, the little engine that was no good was taken off the deck and it was got rid of. Uh, and we brought on some leopard lager, I think it was, cans of that. Uh, when we got to Tahiti, we felt, didn't mind Hinano beer, so we put some of that on board. And just on the beer story, when we got to America and before we were hauled out and getting ready for the race, there were, I think, 30 or 40 dozen cans a beer we couldn't give away, and they were let, we left them on the beach. So you know we found that there's good beer around the world. <laughs> but that was a great trip, and uh, Peter had planned to check, took took some cray boat uh, pots with him, and he was going to check uh, a reef somewhere that he knew on the way. Well, we gave that away, but we carried cray pots. And the first port of call after uh, New Zealand was a little island called Raparitti which is about six or seven hundred miles south of Tahiti. And they see one trading schooner, or they did in those days, one trading schooner a year. The most magnificent island at the top of a volcano where you're a very deep lagoon, but surrounded by land. And, uh, and then we suddenly realised that no one could speak French. 
<laughs> and this was a French place. And I bought a ukulele in in uh, <laughs> in, in Auckland that I was determined I would learn to play the ukulele and couldn't play even Old Black Joe, which was the first thing. And I thought it was a dud. I tried and I tried and I tried and I couldn't get a bloody tune out of this ukulele. And the first little native boy that came on board in the outrugged canoe when they came out to meet us in ukulele, in um, the Rapariti, picked up my ukulele and away he went. And one after the other, the family, and the boys opened a bit of a shot at me. Um, but that was terrific. And then on to Tahiti uh, from Rapa, Iti, uh, and it was the old waterfront in Tahiti, the uh, crook old toilets, and I don't think there was a shower in there, but oh, geez, and girls in lays, and the ukuleles playing at night, and frangipanis behind ears, and a bit of smoking going on here. One there. ever left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, there was a hotel Tahiti there. Um, it was a lovely hotel that we went to a few and uh, on a few occasions, a few nights on the this. And, uh, the uh, there was a lovely Tani, a carved man on the men's toilet door. Well, <laughs> the lights seemed to fuse themselves for a slight moment, and there was a bit of a bang. And the next thing, Tani was on our toilet door. <laughs> And from there it was to Bora Bora. Bora Bora, it was, um, which was just wonderful. Uh, then up to Honolulu, um, about 14 days through there, which was a hell of a trip through the doldrums, but uh, just some great sailing too. Um, the head of Matson Line, the Commodore of Matson Line, was an old friend of Peter Warner's. and. Um, he, joined, he was to join us as the navigator in the Transpac race. Uh, then we took off to, uh, after so, uh, all falling in love and drinking too much booze and what have you in Honolulu, it was a long, hard trip, I think 16 days or something, to San Francisco. And we copped a bit of a storm in the last day out before uh, we hit San Francisco pulled in there, sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge on a Monday morning with the sun coming up behind it, arrived at um, uh, St Francis, St. Francis yeah. Yacht Club. Uh, we were expected, they'd been on the radio, and sitting on a pile waiting for it was a bloke called Derek Bayless. I don't know whether you knew Derek. Mm -hmm. or, does that name ring yeah, a bell? Yeah, yeah. Well, Derek Bayless was an Australian who actually invented the Barrent Winches. Yeah and uh, he worked for Tim Mosley, who was to be our host at, at uh, the club. And that was an interesting story because we had old winches that had been made down in Port Melbourne with spanners ratchet converted with a handle to pull on steel, the, the uh, number one headsail. Um, had not not rope ropes, not rope sheets, wire, wire sheets, mm -hmm. heavy wire. It was round this winch and it was terrifying. An outside pool that went click, click, click round. And w when they saw the magnificence of solar, of, uh, of oh boy, there was a Freudian <laughs> slip. <laughs> the magnificence of Asta with such old crude winches on, Tim Mosley and Derek Baylor said, look, you can't have those. You better put some of our variant winches on. Peter says, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with these, nothing wrong with it. And in the end, Tim got so upset, he said to Peter, I'll tell you what, I've got, he had a yacht called Orient, and his partner had a yacht called Baruna. So they took the BAR and the IENT and Barrent winches. So he said, I'll tell you what I can do. I can't see you, while I'm hosting you, you can't have those winches. I've got a couple that have been tried out on Orient, because he used to use that as a test bed. I'll get them put on, I'll get Derek to put them on. And if you think they're all right, pay me for what, what you reckon they're worth. Well, those winches came back to Australia and I think they were the first variants to come back here. And uh, then our good friend Malcolm Barlow wanted to service them, which he did. <laughs> and soon there was a very similar winch on the market out here. And so the story goes on.